Well, it's still summer and I'm still unemployed. So here's another video. For mini painters, summer is the challenge season. I've seen a ton of people put these together, whether on Discord, Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, and I want to enter more of them. I've only just started doing competitions this year when I entered Smash Bash with this thing. And it was great fun, it was a cool way to get the creative juices flowing. And yeah, sometimes a challenge might seem daunting, but you will learn a lot more trying to do it than not. I want to try and cram at least one challenge into the end of the summer. And right now I'm really feeling the Simso Miniature Shield Slam. The goal is simple enough. Scroll the face, on a shield, take a picture of it, and send it at inrustcommunity at gmail.com before the end of September. Face shields absolutely rock. I've used pre-sculpted ones in the past, and now I want to put my own spin on one for this challenge. Welcome, Moon and Star. Okay, so I was looking for inspiration, leafing through a bunch of old sketchbooks that I've kept since high school. But I didn't have to go that far back. I quickly got stuck on a bunch of IDs that I had doodled for Smash Bash. I only ended up making one design for that challenge, but there were a few IDs in here that I wanted to revisit. And honestly, I was looking for some kind of excuse to make more stuff set at the edge of the sea. And this challenge is as good an excuse as any. I whipped up a quick design that I knew wouldn't be too complex for me to sculpt, and I got to work off of this simple concept. I started with this big round shield from the Annihilators kit. Uh, it's got a bunch of detail on it already. I'm gonna cut and file some of it away, but most will end up being covered by the putty work anyway. In honor of uh, Simso Miniatures, who is putting on this challenge, I'm making the face part entirely out of Milliput. I apply a layer of putty onto the shield and trim it roughly in the shape of a crescent moon. I want to go decently thick here because I'm going to dig into it in some spots and I want contrasting heights with the sun part. I just take my time defining the crescent shape and the nose silhouette. Then I start work on the mouth. I draw a quick line to define where the shape is going to be. Then I try to make a pair of lips that is as sharply defined as possible. This becomes easier as the body starts curing. I would advise using something other than water for lubrication when you're working fine details with Milliput. I'm using Nivea hand cream personally, but you can use oil or Vaseline or whatever is your preference. Once the moon is fully cured, I lay down the shape of the sun's face. I just need to keep a clear delineation between each part, but I want to make the sun's lips match with the moon's. Now that both halves are cured, we're gonna layer some more putty on top. I make a little lentil shape and I apply it where the eye will be. I want to blend the top part of that shape into the face, but keep the bottom clearly defined. That way it will give the impression of being a closed eyelid. Then I add the little sun rays to the gap that I left for them earlier. To finish up the design, I add a little tear under each eye. And that's it for at least a little bit. We'll come back to the shield once the rest of the model has materialized. While I'm in the mood for returning to old IDs, I want to use a model that I've loved for a long time as a base for this build. I love the pose and the armor on this model. The shape is meant to be kind of bat wingy, but it would also work as a kind of fish's fin. Still, uh, we're gonna tweak some things. I'm gonna give her a little sash around the waist of the armor. I'm gonna start with the end ribbons, which you will uh, be able to see fall off multiple times during this video. And then on top of them, I give her a big belt buckle. Then I wrap a couple things of milliput around the armor to make the sash proper. Uh, that big shoulder pad is so 2018, I'm definitely cutting that. For the head I want to use, I need a lower profile to get a better silhouette at the top of the figure. I cut and file the thing into a similar shape as the other one. Next, uh, the knee pads. They need a little more zhuzh to look proper for a sea-themed knight. Right now it doesn't look like anything, but once that lower part is cured, 
and I add the upper part. Uh, there you go, you have a, a, a Salomon's face. For the weapon, I want a longer, more slender silhouette. For each end, I'm picking a weapon that fits the theme of the shield. The front gets a little metal sickle, which is like the moon, you know. And for the back, I add a little flail, which is kind of like the sun, I guess. I wrap the handle in a crimson band and add some quick details to finish up the weapon. Now for the head, uh, nothing too fancy, I'm just using another personal favorite bit of mine. I trim the color of the armor to make sure the fit is good, and then I cushion the head with a little bit of putty and glue it that way. The last bit of sculpting that I'm going to do on this character is adding a flowing scarf. Because this is a floating piece, I need an armature to sculpt around. This is a piece of uh, tin wire. It's adjustable enough to make sure I've got the right shape while the putty cures. With a mix of green stuff and milliput, I wrap the armature and fiddle with the shape until it looks like flowing cloth. I make sure to follow the direction that is established by the flowing veil. On each side of the character, I expand the scarf, keeping the curling and flowing motion going under the arm. To make sure the motion is correct, I set my model to cure at an angle. That way, uh, gravity will pull my piece of putty in the perfect curing position. Like I said in my last video, I love basing, but too often I see basing tutorials that lead to flat and boring results. Fear not, I'm here to fix that. Okay, uh, step one, you are going to go to your local library and check out this book and read it. Okay, I'm actually only half joking. Uh, natural history books, like The Edge of the Sea here, are a fantastic resource for basing. They will give you an idea of how the ecosystem you're trying to set your minis into works, and how you can turn that into a stylized and simplified vignette that is still going to be full of life. Plus, it'll make you smarter. Step two is to look at the miniature you want to base. A character here is standing on a big slanted rock. I love that look and I want to make a couple more rocks in that same kind of angle. The overhang that the rocks are going to create is going to make a fun space for little tidal pools and their inhabitants. Our new rocks are going to accentuate the forward motion that's already in the base sculpt, making it even more dynamic. You can see that I started with a layer of putty to dig my rocks into, as well as create some variation in height around the base. Step 3 is where our book club comes into play. Now that we have a general shape composition for the base, we want to give it some life. First up is some ground cover. Nothing too fancy, just a handful of irregularly placed rocks and ridges, making sure to emphasize the pools that we created in the last step. With a bit of putty, I stick this matchstick on the base. Uh, it's meant to look like one of those bowls that oyster farmers use. I leave the putty to cure, and then it's time to add some sea friends. I take a dot of green stuff and poke it in the middle, then carve little lines into its sides and shape into kind of a cone. And that's how you get a barnacle. Now I just need 50 more. The book taught me that barnacles of the same species like a specific area of the intertidal zone. So I'm gonna exaggerate that and just stick them all along one line around the model. For the rock pools, I picked a couple starfish, some small sea anemones, dog whelk eggs underneath the rocks, and a couple of mussels. Nothing that would be too hard to sculpt or that would drag too much attention away from the figure itself. Uh, while I textured the base with baking soda, let's talk about the interaction between model and base a little more. Uh, one of my hottest scorching hobby takes is that the face of your mini is one of the most important parts of basing. Okay, let me explain. If you know a guy who is even vaguely interested in movies, 
he's probably talked your ear off about something called the Kuleshov effect already. But in case you've been spared, here's a quick primer. The Kuleshov effect is a cinematic phenomenon in which we project feelings and meaning onto a neutral face uh, according to the shots that are attached to that face. Essentially, what we perceive from an actor with a neutral expression uh, changes depending on what we think they are looking at. Now, obviously we're not talking about movie editing here, but I think we can extend that principle to our hobby. By picking a face with a neutral expression, the viewer of the piece is left to interpret the mood of the figure by looking at its surroundings, i.e. the base. And you might say, well, okay, I get it, but you're making a tide pool base. What emotion am I supposed to project from that? To be honest, that's kind of the point here. I want a more mysterious expression on this mini, so I'm not choosing something that would be too straightforward to read. But obviously this would 100% work with a bloody battlefield, a desert, or anything you could imagine. We're gonna finish up the modeling in this video with the last pass on the shield. I get the orientation of the shield down and take a picture to remember it. This is gonna be important because I'm gonna add little pendants and ornaments that would be affected by gravity. Now, I've had a bunch of people ask me about a technique that I used on my Necron Overlord in the last video. Specifically, how I made those things. Well, it's simple, really. Whenever I have leftover green stuff, I roll it into a little stick and let it cure. Once they're cured, I can slice them up whenever I need to make a few medallions and then glue them wherever I need. I'm going to drill some holes into the shield trim where I want a trinket to go. I take a slice, glue it under the hole and repeat until I'm satisfied. Then I sculpt a tiny link between the hole and the medallion. On the upper part of the shield I'm going to do a couple little chains of these medallions and a bunch of little green stuff beads. I use my reference photo to make sure I have the direction and the shape of the chains right. And that is a cool shield. I'm really happy with it. Now I just need to snap an unpainted photo for the challenge, so I take one really quick and then it's off to priming. I'm not showing the painting in this video because I haven't got anything interesting to say about it really. I, I told you about a book and a movie thing this video, so I don't want to hear any complaints about uh, no museum, okay? But without further ado, uh, here's the finished miniature. When I started hobbying, I delved deep into uh, 20 Magazine and the related communities. I found a ton of incredible artists whose work I still follow, and Simpson Miniature was a huge influence. And now that I've been putting my work out there, I get to chat with a bunch of awesome people like him. There was no way I was gonna miss this challenge. I know it can be nerve-wracking to participate in competitions, but I promise it'll be a fun challenge. If you want to enter, uh, you have until the end of September to submit a photo of your unpainted shield. A link is account and the challenge post in the description, as well as the In Rust We Trust Discord, so go check those out if you haven't already. Ah, <sighs> anyway, it's the end of the video. Subscribe, because that would be neat. Uh, look at my Instagram for more stuff. Uh, leave a nice comment uh, on this video, because that uh, activates the feel-good chemicals in my brain. And uh, yeah, go make your own face shields. I'll see you in the next video where I uh, activate your MK Ultra trigger. Farewell, sweet Naravar. Better luck on your next incarnation.